Hello and welcome to Kerbal Fuel Crisis Episode 6. If you remember in the last episode, we were setting up our mining base, and that is what we're going to continue doing this episode with our rover truck that we were able to fly out last time. Currently, it's very slowly climbing a hill. I will tell you that this is, in fact, at uh, one and a half times acceleration on the video, so you can imagine how slowly this truck actually moves in uh, real time. Unfortunately, um, couldn't get it to climb the hills very well. I talked last time about how annoying it is to build a base on hills. If we have to set up a second base anytime, I'm going to make sure that we scout the location much better. It'll make things go much more easily. But I think we've learned enough in uh, as we've gone around here that we could set up a base much more easily than we could this time. So, lots of exciting things happening in this episode. I won't spoil too much for you, but it's going to be a very action-packed episode. So, uh, stay tuned while I try to cover up how slow this rover is moving by talking about it and over it. Anyway, finally making it to the second habitation module. We now have uh, five Kerbals who are going to be in near-permanent residence here as well as cycling crew that will come by on the reloader planes, etc. So we have the uh, current one set up by Sam Kelkerman, who is back at base, and then we are picking up this uh, other habitation module that we are going to attach to the main base. A uh, similar application as last time, except that uh, we hope things go a lot more smoothly now. If you recall, we had to actually uh, lift Kerbals around, do all kinds of shenanigans and things. Uh, this time we are hoping to simply be able to activate the magnet and have it attach to the uh, module without too many problems. Now, of course, uh, never get it in the right place the first time, and the thing starts trying to roll down the hill, but with a little bit of swinging, I'm sure we'll be able to get everything lined up exactly where we need it. The real trick here is to extend the magnet exactly at the right time uh, to get it to land exactly in the middle of the pod, which we did not do. Thankfully, these pods are actually relatively light. Uh, compared to other rocket parts and some other things we could have used, these habitation modules are quite light, uh, so picking them up off of the center of gravity isn't going to cause too much of a problem, especially since we really just need to get them back down to those landing legs without them tipping over <laughs> too badly is our real only goal here. Now you will note that I am backing down the hill. This is because that with the crane bit attached, um, I are afraid that the crane is going to fall over forward if we uh, try to go forward down the hill. Um, I believe that they actually use this application many, many times in other fields with heavy lifting and such. Uh, do not put your heaviest part of your vehicle going downhill because you will flip over. You're already at, uh, this looks to be at least a 45 degree incline. Now skipping that because you don't want to see me go down the hill, we narrowly avoid hitting our solar panels here. Thankfully our curvals are great drivers and we're able to not smash into that. It wouldn't have been that big of a loss because as you can see this is the uh, something like the seventh solar panel that we have and we're bringing more later on. Um, it's quite a struggle to maneuver this thing around. I think I'm going to have to design a better one later that uh, takes into account some of the mobility issues we've had with this one. This is the first, uh, this is the Mark 1 series of Crane. So really what can you expect? So uh, we're just going to plop this right back down here and uh, really that'll be about it for the habitation module. We are going to plug it into the others just to be able to share power, have everything as one single docked unit, but uh, that's the same procedure we've already gone through using Kerbal attachment systems. So nothing too remarkable about that, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, coming up, we now get to a slightly more monar <laughs> remarkable, monarchical thing, some kind of weird made up word. A more remarkable part of the base, uh, relatively speaking. This I designed to be a both a power generator and a storage container. You'll see that it has quite a few of the Kerbal Attachment System boxes attached to the outside. Uh, that is because we want to have as many spare parts and fuel lines and things as possible for this. Now since this unfortunately did come down uh, on its side as opposed to the others that landed normally 
um, we want to send out one of our curvals here to manually attach the magnet. Uh, that way we can get it onto the top of the vessel without too much trouble. Um, it would be a pain to get it to attach using the crane to have to do some swinging and things. But this way we'll be able to lift it back up, uh, the right side up, and bring it down the hill that way. And uh, just be able to place it very neatly next to the base. Um, just uh, the way we planned in our head uh, before we built these missions and saw all the things that could go wrong. Now you see that we did lose a solar panel on the side, but all the boxes and power generators are, in fact, uh, working fine. Now, uh, the, keen ex the keen observer here may have noticed that the uh, habitation unit that we just brought in has uh, disappeared. I don't know why it did that. It appears that that temporal shift that we encountered in episode 2 may have some unforeseen consequence consequences as we move forward. And one of them appears to be that the second habitation model uh, spontaneously vanished. While unfortunate, it does not in fact break the integrity of our base. It just means that some of our Kerbals may have to sleep inside of their ships for the time being. So, uh, you know, temporal crises aside, all in all the base is shaping up rather well. Uh, again, we're going to attach this using the Kerbal attachment system. Uh, this one actually does have a point to being attached to the rest of the base. It is power carrying uh, quite a few power generators and batteries on it. Uh, as well as solar panels. The majority of the mining base is solar, but it'd be nice to be able to get through the night. Now, we have left and since come back from the mining and we discover that SamCal is uh, catatonic. We have no idea why. We don't know what happened. We left, we came back, and SamCal has in fact been unable to move. Uh, we reach out to him via comms and discover that he can actually control his suit lights. Uh, how, we do not know, since he does not apparently move, but he is apparently still alive, simply um, unable to move. Some sort of strange paralysis is set in. This may have something to do with the uh, strange temporal shift that we had earlier that made our habitation unit vanish. So sending out one of the Kerbal pilots who happens to still be here on the uh, previous crashed plane mission that you may remember was heartbreaking back in episode four, I believe? I'm getting confused myself. We send him out to investigate, hoping that he might be able to wake up uh, poor Sam Cal and get him moving again. So upon closer inspection, we can see that he uh, is completely immobile. Even when being poked and uh, yelled at, I'm sure the Kerbals are screaming at the top of their lungs, we have no luck in reviving him. Of course, we still need to try every course of action available to us, including uh, Kerbal CPR, which we will see in a second here. <coughs> Kerbal CPR, a uh, very violent process, unfortunately. So avert your eyes if you have young people in the audience. Uh, parental discretion is advised. First step is to position the body, which does not seem to wake him up. You'd think that the uh, ground moving through his helmet would in fact do something to revive him. But unfortunately not. So uh, chest compressions are also to no avail. So unfortunately uh, Sam Cal for the time being is going to have to be left here until we find a cure for whatever strange paralysis has afflicted him. Um, now let me tell you what exactly happened to poor Sam Cal here. During my recording of this uh, while I was halfway through setting up the base the new Kerbal patch came out, the Asteroid Redirect Missions um, 2.5, no, 2.3.5, that is what I was trying to say, uh, came out. And uh, remarkably, I did a few tests, it did not break my save file, it did not break my mods with a couple of updates, so I decided to install it and move forward using that because it does bring so many interesting new features and fixes into the game. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get asteroids because this is an existing save file. Um, hopefully, we'll find a way to incorporate that later on. But for now, we're going to just have no asteroids. So being that poor Sam Cal is unavailable, we are going to send out Bill in the plane from the very first second episode. Uh, if anyone's confused by that, uh, don't be. 
or was it the third episode? I can't remember. Anyway, our old supersonic jet, which, uh, as you may remember, has a quite ridiculous takeoff uh, speed. In fact, it moves forward, tilts up, and takes off from a dead stop. Um, with all the th experimenting and things I've been doing on these episodes, this, I think, is still my best plane, and I'm sorry that we have not gotten to use it more often, but at the moment we will be sending it out to collect some key thing to bring back to base. Uh, it's hopefully going to be making a few more <laughs> runs back and forth to bring the key thing back to the main base. I have been experimenting with uh, ways to set up a mobile launch system at the base itself. But for now, I think uh, just shuttling Keithane back and forth is going to be an easier method. I don't know if any of you has used the <coughs> extra planetary launch pads mod, but those things are heavy, and I'm having trouble figuring out how to fly them. <coughs> oh, Bill Kerman very carefully moving his way around the other ship with the thankfully motorized landing gear of the uh, B-9 aerospace packs. Which, um, unfortunately I discovered have a glitch that makes them functionally unusable for high-speed takeoffs. Now, as we can see in the background, I unfortunately didn't get a good shot because I didn't notice right away, but uh, Sam Cowell's rescuer has now also succumbed to the deadly virus. So, it appears any Kerbals that we leave outside of their ships uh, for long periods of time are going to be susceptible, so we're going to have to be careful about that in the future. Also, we discovered that the uh, keythane drills are not working correctly. Uh, you may not have seen I was messing with those while I was talking about the cribbles. I do apologize. I skipped the most important part. So the keythane drills are not working. We did not have as much keythane in the mining vessel as we expected. The drills did not appear to be functioning. And on closer inspection, our keythane map seems to have disappeared. The temporal shift may have actually had more ramifications than we yet realize. So we've attached a keythane scanner to this uh, large space truck, which hopefully will be able to get everything working again when we get to the site. <coughs> and uh, use that keythane scanner to verify that the resources we are seeking are still at this mining base that we only so recently got working to its fullest potential. Uh, as we can see, the uh, Space Center and surrounding waters do not contain any keythane, as was previously thought. Hopefully, uh, this trend remains that everything has stayed the same and we still have some keythane at the mining base that we can extract because we just got the dang thing working. Though, as I said, I am confident that should we have to set up a second mining location, we will be able to take what we have learned in these past few episodes and uh, do it much more efficiently. Now, going over the island, unfortunately no keythane there either. That would have been a very convenient spot for a new base, very close to home. And then uh, two of our engines explode. Now, while some may see this as a problem, I see it simply as a challenge. And uh, we're going to continue the mission regardless. Only real difference this made to the flying of this aircraft was that it uh, caused it to pitch up a lot more than it previously did. Which is fine, actually, because uh, if we put any keythane in the thing, we're going to need that extra pitch. Now, we are nearing the mining location with the scanner. We're going to be able to see what has happened to our keythane. It is gone. Something about the new mod, or the temporal shift, or whatever the Kerbals call gods, have decided that as soon as our mining base gets fully set up and operational, it runs dry. Oh well, even the best of wells sometimes do not strike pay dirt. Pay no attention to that metaphor, none of it made sense. <coughs> anyway, gliding back in, uh, thankfully we were high enough when the engines exploded that we were able to have more or less a straight guide path, guide path into the base without having to uh, utilize the engines too much more since they do unbalance the craft so much. More or less a uh, normal landing with a little bit of stutter there. I apologize. Not having keythane in this area has, uh, and the new patch have helped the lag considerably though. Uh, as you see, I have not dropped below green frame rate this entire time, which is amazing. 
incredibly amazing. I think the new patch really, really did improve things, which is why we're going to continue to use it, even though it does seem to have destabilized our keythane fields. Coming in for the weirdest landing I've ever made, we uh, attempt to hit the brakes in a second here, and then we accidentally hit the landing gear right about now, which brings the plane down for my worst landing yet with explosions. So now we have uh, two catatonic kerbals, two stranded kerbals in the truck, two stranded two stranded kerbals in the new crashed plane, one stranded kerbal in the old crashed plane, and Bill. Bill being the only useful kerbal left to us uh, at the moment. So he's just going to jump out of his plane here, rush over to the habitation module, and attach a... well, first he's going to attach a pipe to this plane, because this plane was made before we standardized all of the pieces to always contain fuel endpoints. Uh, luckily though, this particular plane uh, was equipped with a fuel endpoint box that we brought with us because as I said, it was before everything was standardized. So we wanted to be sure that we could augment our station as necessary. So linking the, they're forgetting to link in fact. Now linking the fuel line up to the main base we're going to take the remaining fuel from this base back to the main KSC Space Center and um, basically call this base a wash. It's unfortunate, but we learned a lot. We got some keythane from it. We're going to be able to bring it back to home and uh, hopefully use it to launch a new exploratory flight and continue our quest to get back into space. I was hoping to be in space a lot sooner than this, but what can you do? Things break. It just happens. Don't worry, we'll find out something. We'll figure out something interesting to do later on. Now, Bill, again, using that great, amazing motorized landing gear, please put that into the vanilla game. Please, 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 please. I love the motorized landing gear and I want more. Unfortunately, he does take out a solar panel on his way home, but we're not going to hold that against poor Bill, as, like we said, this base is pretty much a wash. We're going to have to transport our crew back home and uh, deal with our wounded. But for now, Bill is just going to have to make his way back to base on what are essentially fumes. Uh, the fuel shortage is really starting to affect our flyers as this one was unable to refuel back at base and has now made two trips to the mining base on one tank which is proving to be a little too much for it and we can only hope that we have enough to get back home. Uh, thankfully we are able to just start flying home as you see the uh, the temporal anomalies are still playing Mary Hob with our way with our radar and we've lost part of our scan again. Um, I think this was my problem. I didn't uh, completely update everything properly, so probably all my fault. However, we did run out of fuel on the way back to base. We are in a high altitude, so I'm very hopeful that we are going to be able to glide all the way back to the Space Center using this plane. Uh, this plane's very stable when gliding. I was very, very impressed with these B9 parts and wings. I do recommend that anyone playing the normal vanilla game. I don't um, I don't use any of the aerodynamic mods because I'm sure this thing would spin out instantly if I did. <laughs> Thankfully this plane is able to glide very nicely, but um, I'm starting to lose confidence in my earlier assertion that we were going to be able to make it all the way back down to the base on the altitude and speed we had, being that we are already back down to about 30 meters a second, which I need to get better at my conversions because I have no idea how fast that is. I use miles per hour like most people in the US. Um, I have no idea how quickly meters per second is at all. In fact, I don't know anyone who uses meters per second except for scientists because as far as I know, Europe uses uh, kilometers per hour. Anyway, <coughs> coming down over the ocean. Uh, best we can hope for is a very soft landing. Lowering the landing gear 
in case it helps. But uh, soft touchdown, at least. Water in this game is incredibly hard, for those who do not know. So uh, being able to touch down a plane without it crashing is a huge accomplishment. Unfortunately for poor Bill, we're going to have to leave him here for just a little while. We'll mount and rescue next episode, as well as along with all the other Kerbals. But the Kerbals have better things to deal with right now. Unfortunately, more pressing matters have occurred, since we have lost all of the data we had on Keythane deposits on the planet, and apparently they would no longer be accurate since the base was on a huge Keythane deposit that has now uh, disappeared. So, we are able to send out the rover from one of our very first episodes. I need to look up when this was introduced. I think it may have been episode two. <laughs> the mobile storage unit, more mobile storage and converter to be slightly more specific. Uh, we were able to take our first shipment of Keythane, bring it back to base, and convert it to rocket fuel in this very machine, which is now driving up to this weird looking thing on the launch platform here. Uh, to save fuel, we have designed an incredibly unorthodox rocket, which I'll go into greater deal on in a minute. Suffice it to say, uh, some of you may think it's cheating. I do not, however. We have very, very limited fuel resources, and we need to use them <coughs> very, very efficiently, which means we're going to use weird methods to get things into space, at least for a little while. Once we have our supply lines fully set up the way that I am envisioning in my brain, that's right, I do think ahead a little bit. Usually no more than five or ten minutes, but I do think ahead in this series very slightly. Anyway, bringing the mobile storage unit up to the launch pad, which is exactly why it is a mobile storage unit, and not the very more uh, common but incredibly less useful non-mobile storage units. Bring it up to the runway with the box of, and uh, not having the ladder work apparently, with the box of endpoints that we have on all of our earlier vehicles. This too was made before the standardization was decided. And we're going to be able to link this to the rocket, fill it with fuel, and launch it hopefully into a low polar orbit. That is the most efficient way to scan for Keythane. Now you may be wondering what these large things on the side are. They're in fact balloons. Anybody remember the Zeppelin that we used to rescue good old Jebediah? This is from the same pack. It is uh, hugely unrealistic, but what are you going to do? <coughs> we can only use these giant balloons to shoot up into the atmosphere, almost instantly reaching 400 meters a second in vertical gain shooting up through the thickest parts of the atmosphere, which are the most fuel-intensive. This is the entire reason we decided to use balloons. I believe that NASA actually considered doing this and may have done it with a small probe at one point. Unfortunately, the uh, mass doesn't quite work out in real life. But using balloons like this is incredibly efficient to get out of the lower atmosphere, which is where you use 90% of your fuel. Anyone can tell you it takes at least half your fuel to get into orbit, usually more. So, we lower the balloon so that the rocket does not crash into them. This is the point at which they stop becoming useful because the atmosphere is just too thin. And we launch our rocket. And you see that we have a fairing. Because, why not? I wanted to point that out because I'm playing with the new with the procedural fairings mod. And it is awesome. Anybody who wants fairings, just get the procedural fairings. It's amazing. It's amazingly amazing. And it still works fine. They updated it for the new patch, so don't worry. Works great, and I'm loving it. And there we go. Our probe is now away out of that incredibly cool fairing that I'm going to use all the time from now on. I mean, I, I just use it for looks. I don't even care about the aerodynamic qualities. Anyway, I'm done gushing about the fairing. We're now putting our probe into our polar orbit. It's an incredibly small, simple probe. Was able to use very little fuel. Unfortunately, that was all of the fuel that we had back at base. So we're essentially going to be at square one moving forward here. We are deploying our scanner into the low orbit. We don't have a functional mining base. We are out of fuel. 
All we have is some infrastructure that we have built up around the base and the knowledge and know-how that we were able to build up to this point. So next episode, we're going to decide how to move forward. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to set up a much, much faster mining operation and get things back on track uh, much more quickly. If we can't, I'm going to be editing out a lot more. Don't worry, I do not intend to have a complete repeat of the last five episodes. In the meantime, I'm going to let this scanner go. You can enjoy the rhythmic beeping of the keythane. As I say, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, like, subscribe, follow on Twitter, all of the fun things. <clears throat> Kerbal Fuel Crisis coming to you every Thursday as long as I can. If it cannot, if I have a delay or something, I will announce it on Twitter. So follow me there for the most up-to-date of the updates. In the meantime, I am Gethwin. I do hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>